Do you know that checkbox you can tick when booking a flight or ordering a package that promises you can offset all of the carbon that you just emitted and you're good? Have you ever wondered whether that's actually legit? And we're not the only ones who can apparently buy our way out. Some of the world's largest companies are relying heavily on carbon offsets to reach their ambitious climate pledges. Apple is going carbon neutral. Carbon neutral. That's why at Shell, our ambition is to be a net zero emissions energy business by 2050. Yep, even fossil fuel companies are vowing to emit net zero carbon soon in large part thanks to carbon offsets. How the hell is that supposed to work? And are carbon offsets in general to be trusted? And why am I stuck in the mud in the middle of nowhere to answer that? Hi, I'm Kiyodora, and you're seeing climate action in action. So cheesy. I know carbon offsets don't really sound that sexy, but they're kind of a hot topic right now. So the basic idea of an offset is, is that if you're naughty and you emit a lot of carbon, that you can pay to have those emissions reduced somewhere else. The logic is that since the emitted CO2 goes into the atmosphere and damages the entire planet, you can cancel it out anywhere, preferably somewhere where it's easier and cheaper to do so. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think offsets are trees, planting them or protecting them from being cut down. Trees, of course, sequester carbon, making them a very popular offset. Or you could pay projects to install renewable energy, like wind, solar or biogas. Then we get to the niche stuff, capturing the excess methane that seeps out from landfills or open coal mines. Effective, since methane is about 25 times more potent than CO2. Or you can have even worse greenhouse gases destroyed or avoided, like laughing gas, which is about 300 times worse than CO2. Okay, so I wanted to know exactly where my money goes to when I compensate my own private carbon footprint. Let's say I'm flying from Berlin to Tokyo. Please don't shoot me. I'm visiting my family. There is a box here where I can say offset CO2 emissions that says supports 10 international projects for a global impact. But I want to know which and I want to know where. Majority of the projects are in the global south, but there are a few in Europe. So two of the projects are in Germany, actually, and both are not that far away. Let's go there. So, hallo. hallo, ich bin Kio. Ja, Karen, herzlich willkommen im Königsmoor. Hm? Karen Markgraf sells carbon offsets for a non-profit in Germany's northernmost state. Also meine Frage ist quasi, was passiert mit meinem Geld? Es soll ja CO2 einsparen, aber wie funktioniert das hier? Diese ganzen Flächen wurden alle mal trockengelegt äh, über Drainagen und ähm, damit man hier ja, Landwirtschaft betreiben konnte in einem äh, Moor, was trockengelegt wird. Das wird regelrecht zu einer CO2-Schleuder, sagt man auch. That's because the organic matter in wetlands, called peat, stores a lot of carbon over oftentimes thousands of years. But when the peatland gets drained and dries out, the carbon comes in contact with the oxygen on the surface and emits CO2. A mind-boggling amount of it, actually. About 5% of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions come from damaged peatlands. That's more than twice the greenhouse gases emitted by aviation globally. To reverse that, this project is aiming to re-wet this landscape. Also es wird äh, unten die Torfschicht abgezogen, die Oberfläche, und daraus werden jetzt äh, die Dämme gebaut, damit dann nachher auf dieser Fläche auch äh, das Regenwasser wieder gehalten wird. Also da wird quasi so ein Pool gebaut. Wie eine Wanne, wie ein Pool, muss man sich das vorstellen. <lacht> wow. Around the corner there is a dam that was completed half a year ago. 
Wir stehen jetzt auch auf, auf einem der Dämme. Dadurch, dass wir hier wieder äh, den Wasserstand anheben können, das Regenwasser wird ja hier gehalten durch die Dämme, die wir bauen, kann nicht mehr äh, der Kohlenstoff entweichen. Und wenn dieses Moor wieder intakt ist, sich die Vegetation wieder bildet und nachher auch die Torfmoose, wird noch zusätzlich auch CO2 aus der Atmosphäre gezogen. Und es gibt so eine Faustregel, ähm, wo es heißt, ähm, pro Hektar Moor sind es ungefähr... 10 Tonnen pro Jahr. To put that into perspective, a flight back and forth from Germany to Japan alone emits about 3 tons of CO2. Das heißt, man braucht richtig viel Moor, um das auszugleichen. Ja. Yeah. And this is what the water basin turns into after a few years. Und die Natur holt sich jetzt immer mehr mm, ja, hier ihren Raum zurück auch. These more offsets are voluntary offsets, meaning that anybody can buy them voluntarily if, for example, they want to reduce their flight shame like I do. And companies can also buy them to offset their millions of tons of emissions. But they're also mandatory offsets. Mandatory offsets are offsets that companies have to buy to stay under the maximum amount of carbon that they are allowed to emit per year. This mechanism was set in place by the Kyoto Protocol and updated in the Paris Agreement. The mandatory market used to make up the lion's share of offsets, but that's changing rapidly. You can imagine why when we rewind to those carbon neutrality promises. Last time I checked, you can't produce cars or deliver goods or pump oil out of the ground without emitting CO2. So to get to net zero, you need some of that sweet bookkeeping magic. The voluntary market has been growing rapidly in the past years, and 2021 is likely to set a new record. Renewable energy as well as forestry and land use projects are currently by far the most popular offsets. There's just one small problem. Many of the carbon offsets just don't offset carbon. Whoops! There's a lot of dirty tricks happening in carbon offsetting where one ton of carbon ends up becoming half ton of carbon and in many cases even zero tons of carbon. That's Yeb Sanyo, head of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. Offsetting has a very long and well-documented history of problems with the validity of, of uh, carbon offsetting projects. A landmark 2016 study found out that 85% of the mandatory carbon offsets the Kyoto Protocol had put in place were not decreasing CO2 in the atmosphere. 85%. And not much has changed since then. One small example, another study by a carbon offset broker recently looked at 100 voluntary offsets, mostly the popular afforestation and conservation projects, and found that over 90% don't deliver on their promises. So how the hell is that possible? Well, it has to do with the very complex nature of carbon offsets. So back to the peatland. The question is whether the project that you're funding might have just happened anyway. And if that's the case, then your payment isn't really making a difference. This is Derek Burkhoff. He has worked on energy and climate policy for more than 18 years. It's not really causing emissions to go down. Um, so this is the real Achilles heel of the carbon offset market. Was wäre hier passiert ohne das Geld quasi von den Kompensationen? Ja, es wäre wahrscheinlich weiterhin ähm, als äh, Ackerland oder auch als Weidefläche genutzt werden. Die Fläche wird trockengelegt und der Kohlenstoff hätte so richtig schön immer weiter wäre in die Atmosphäre gegangen. This project is what is called additional. The money invested had an additional effect of reducing emissions that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And that's most often the case for projects that would not be economically viable without offset money. For example, destroying industrial pollutants. There is no financial reason for this to happen. The only reason why this gets done is because people pay for it to be done. A lot of methane capturing and destroying projects are similar. But now we get into trickier territory. It's not so clear in a lot of um, energy efficiency projects, renewable energy projects. That was a case, for example, in India. A study showed over half of wind turbines built with carbon offset money would most probably have been built anyway. Planting trees or conservation projects can also be problematic because planting trees is nice and good and all, and they're great CO2 suckers, but only as long as they live. 
many of these projects on paper have promised those plantations stay for the longest time and then after 10 years you visit the site and it's gone. For example, satellite images collected by ProPublica in Cambodia show that in the forested areas that should have been completely protected, half of the forest has been logged or otherwise destroyed 10 years later. Forest fires are another big risk because burnt trees aren't going to sequester carbon anytime soon. Afforestation and reforestation are seen as so problematic that the EU does not allow them as mandatory offsets. So as popular as they are, they are not the safest bet. The next question is, will the problem just go elsewhere? Let's say you buy carbon offsets to help save the Amazon from deforestation in Brazil. Maybe that will just shift the problem to parts of the Amazon that are not protected, and the rainforest will get logged in neighboring Peru. And last, but certainly not least, is the problem of double counting. Or who gets bragging rights? In the case of this moor, it's quite simple. A German airline emits CO2 by flying its planes and reduces that CO2 by re-wetting this moor. Germany overall gets to reduce its emissions. But what if the same German airline reduces its emissions by planting trees in Nicaragua? Which, yes, it also does. Who gets to claim the reduction in emissions? This may sound like a technicality, but it's one of the major problems carbon offsets are facing. No two countries or no two actors should be counting the same emission reduction towards their emission reduction goals. Unless double counting is avoided, my purchase of the carbon credit makes no difference to global emissions. So Nicaragua, in this case, would have to allow the foreign German company to count these offsets as their own for collective emission reductions to work. While the mandatory market has set rules to ensure this, the voluntary market does not have any. And that ties into a bigger problem. Imagine you are a multi-billion dollar company wanting to offset your millions of tons of CO2. It's very tempting to offset your massive carbon footprint in the easiest, cheapest way, right? Which in a lot of cases means less regulated, easily implemented projects, often in the global south, where restrictions are not so rigorous and prices are low. Not to mention, many offsetting programs have a history of disrespecting land rights of indigenous and local communities. It's really hard for a normal consumer to tell whether a project is legit or not. I mean, I traveled all the way here, this checks out, but you can't do that for every single project. One indicator, though, can be price. Wie viel kostet es, eine Tonne CO2 hier zu kompensieren? Eine Tonne um, CO2 steht für ein More Futures und kostet uh, 64 Euro. That's quite steep. Some carbon offset platforms offset a ton for 23 euros, or even 11 US dollars, about 10 euros. When single carbon offset schemes are way below that price, that's not a good sign. Any activity that was going to happen anyway can generate emission reductions for essentially zero marginal cost. So I would be weary of a large number of project uh, credits um, that are inexpensive. OK, quick recap. Many projects don't offset carbon, and some carbon offsets may also just help big corporations to greenwash. But, and the IPCC calculations show that, it will be extremely hard to reach our climate targets without some form of offsets. So what should we do? There has to be an oversight function, a system, uh, an institution that could truly uh, guard against cheating and misrepresentation in the way carbon offset projects are being run. There are international certifications that are supposed to guarantee the quality, like the gold standard as well as the verified carbon standard. But even they are not always watertight and certifications are voluntary. Then there also needs to be a change in the type of projects we focus on. A lot of the market to date has been oriented around cheaper mitigation, and I think we need to flip that around, focus on um, you know, where the investment is needed um, to bring about transformational change. But first and foremost, Man sollte natürlich am Anfang immer sehen, wo kann ich einsparen, was kann ich machen. Das sollte immer der erste Weg sein. 
Many companies do clearly state that in their net zero strategies, but it's often unclear how many tons of emissions are getting reduced and which get offset. The major polluting companies are trying to find a way out of taking real action to tackle the climate emergency. The world can't offset its way out of climate change. We all need to be reducing emissions uh, and doing so rapidly. So after all of this information, would you buy a carbon offset now? Please let us know in the comments and also subscribe. We post videos like this every Friday.